1918 and 1919, up to 50 million people died in a global outbreak of Spanish influenza. The world's graveyards filled up with the dead. In recent years, that spectre has returned. Fears of a new flu pandemic with the potential to kill millions. But today, there are new weapons in the fight against flu. Potentially powerful antivirals and vaccines may be able to limit a pandemic. Drugs like Tamiflu, made by Swiss company Roche, which have big claims for its product. Tamiflu is an antiviral. It works directly against the virus to stop it from spreading within the body. Tamiflu can be used to treat or to prevent influenza infection. As new influenza threats emerged, there was huge money at stake, especially if governments were to bulk buy the new drugs and they would take their advice from the United Nations. It's incredibly important that WHO is absolutely squeaky clean in terms of the processes that it uses to generate guidelines and, and other information. So it's very important that it be transparent in that respect because so many countries are dependent on it. With vaccines unlikely to emerge until months into a pandemic, some felt that we could buy time by using antivirals to alleviate symptoms. In 2004, the WHO recommended that countries stockpile antivirals. So how transparent was that process? The World Health Organization should be above commercial interests. But did that decision to endorse antivirals, which opened the floodgates to billions of dollars of sales, rest solely on scientific evidence? In October 2002, 22 scientists, nine WHO Secretariat members and two drug industry representatives met in Geneva to draw up draft guidelines on the use of antivirals and vaccines for influenza. These form the basis of advice issued to the world two years later. Included in this were three annexes, each drawn up by an eminent scientist present at the original meetings. Professor Carl Nicholson produced a section describing the potential dangers of pandemic flu. Professor Arnold Monto produced the section on the need for and difficulties in producing vaccines. And Professor Hayden produced a section on the benefits of antiviral drugs and the need for global stockpiles. The WHO would be expected to examine any financial links these three scientists and any others advising it might have with pharmaceutical companies. It says it did, but it's refusing to make public the details. Our own investigations show that all three of the 2004 Annex Writing Doctors have had relevant financial links to pharmaceutical companies. Fred Hayden is a respected professor of virology. He prepared the annex that called for antiviral stockpiling. Informed by the advice of Hayden and others, the WHO recommended stockpiling. In 2004, this guidance was distributed to nations as the definitive thinking on pandemic planning. It was a stamp of approval that helped spark a worldwide rush for the drugs. Around $10 billion have since been spent on Roche's drug Tamiflu and another $2 billion on rival Relenza, made by GSK. Our investigation has learnt that Annex preparer, Professor Hayden, was receiving funds from Roche until late 2004. He's made declarations of being a former consultant for the drug company of being a member of Roche's Speakers Bureau and of receiving grants and research support. At a press conference last year, he spoke about his paid work from Roche and others up to 2004. I, I actually was an investigator and a one-time paid consultant for Roche and some other companies also, including GSK and, I, and others uh, that were involved in antiviral drug or vaccine development. As a scientist, Professor Hayden routinely declares his ties with pharmaceutical companies, even if the WHO does not. He told us that he has always... ...striven to use my role as an advisor to these companies as an opportunity to help direct the development of more effective interventions for influenza and other respiratory viruses. 
Another scientist supporting antiviral stockpiling at the World Health Organization in 2002 and 2004 was Professor Carl Nicholson, based at the UK's University of Leicester. We've managed to obtain some of Roche's early marketing materials for Tamiflu. Here in these corporate brochures, speaking at Roche-funded symposia, you can see Professors Hayden and Nicholson, international experts on influenza. They were promoting their important new findings, but just how extensive were their industry ties? In 2003, we've learned Professor Nicholson declared previous funding from antiviral drug makers, details the WHO chose not to release. Up to 2001, he had been paid ad hoc consultancy fees by Roche. He received speaking fees and research funding from Roche and rival GSK. And he'd been paid by GSK as a consultant to help develop their own antiviral, Relenza. Professor Nicholson told us he received no more than a few hundred pounds for his work with Roche. And he told us... I understand the view that experts with conflicts of interest should not advise governments or organisations such as the WHO, but to exclude such people from discussions could deprive WHO and decision makers of important new information. The final orthodontics annex in those 2004 guidelines was prepared by Professor Arnold Monto of the University of Michigan. That same year he declared a professional relationship with, among others, Roche. Once again, despite Professor Monto openly declaring his pharmaceutical industry links elsewhere, the WHO chose not to make this information public. In a detailed email response to our questions, Professor Monto told us that the WHO have always impressed me as being keen to avoid situations where even an appearance of conflict can occur, especially in terms of funds or products accepted by the organisation. It's clear that all of those people have at various times declared these conflicts and it wouldn't have taken really any work at all for WHO to know about them. So one has to assume that WHO did know or was really making no effort to find out. And if they did know, then I think it's, it's really odd and, and, and unacceptable that WHO should use these people as key contributors to a major international guideline on the pandemic. If you think about uh, Dr Hayden, he's the Pele of virologists. Uh, Dr. Monto is the Pele of epidemiologists in the influenza world. They're the best you can get and we need to go to the best in order to get the best scientific advice. So what we did if, with that committee was they drafted this guidance and that guidance was put out to public review for six months. It was up on the WHO website through some point in 2003. In any case for for six months and so we got then a whole series of comments from around the world to verify, to ensure its robustness. For the WHO, a conflict exists if the expert has a financial interest that could unduly influence the expert's position with respect to the subject matter being considered. And if that interest left a reasonable person uncertain. WHO's rules in 2002 and 2004 required declarations to be filled out relating to possible conflicts going back three years. If there is a conflict, advisers are supposed either not to take part at all, to stay out of sensitive discussions, or to take part but to have their conflicts of interest disclosed. So you don't know if um, those specific individuals filled out declarations of interest forms? Um, they, declarations of interest were asked for from all participants, okay. yes. And do you know if those specific individuals signed a declaration of interest form? Um, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe they did, but I'm not 100% sure. The WHO has told us that a declaration of interest statement exists relating to the 2002 and 2004 antiviral and vaccine meetings. But WHO Director General Margaret Chan's office refuses to release to us any details of the declarations. We have to balance all the time the privacy of the individual versus the robustness of the guidelines. If the declarations of interest were taken, then, then arguably you could find out whether they did have conflicts of interest. Um, I, I really, that's something that I would have to 
investigate and get back to you on. I really can't answer that at this point. I'm the customer, if you like, for WHO guidelines as a patient. If I don't understand what competing interests might have uh, influenced the way that they came out, um, then it's of no interest to me at all that Margaret Chan knows what they are. I need to know as the customer for her products, and her products are guidelines. In its latest advice on influenza antivirals and vaccines, the WHO has published declarations of interest. We now know, for example, that Professor Arnold Monto has recently received between $3,000 and $10,000 in consultancy work for GSK. Professor Hayden, too, declares his work as an unpaid consultant for both companies, among others. The WHO recently described potential conflicts of interest as inherent in any relationship, but says that it protects against undue influence. Yet a new Council of Europe report into last year's swine flu pandemic also raises concerns about transparency at the WHO and the risks of undue pharmaceutical company influence. There will be uh, people who interact with industry, that's perfectly acceptable. We need to have good interaction between industry and public health industry with clinical medicine. But to be paid consultants, to be people who are actually on the payroll, to be people who've actually published uh, or, or spoken at promotional events uh, for the company, I think that really is way too far over onto the unacceptable side of things. The WHO has launched an internal inquiry into its handling of the recent pandemic, which will include transparency issues, but it's not due to report until next year. Until then, at least, doubts will remain over the ability of this United Nations body to make impartial decisions on behalf of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm.